Back to Stitch Club, presented by the Davenport Public Library. This is episode two of adding embroidery to your clothes. In the first episode, I talked about the different tools and materials you'll need and what kind of clothing works best for adding decorative stitching. In today's episode, I'll show you how to make some basic stitches and get started on one of the designs. All of the stitches I'm going to show you today are very easy and are ideal for the beginner or as a brush up for more advanced stitchers. Despite their simplicity, these stitches can be used in a variety of ways to add interest and personality to your stitching. If you'd like to practice these stitches before you start on your design, you'll need a piece of scrap material, something close to the same weight as the jeans or shirt you'll be stitching on. Since this is practice, the material doesn't have to be fancy or special. It only needs to be large enough to fit comfortably in your hoop. Of course, you'll also need some thread snips some embroidery floss, and an embroidery needle. Let's get started. I'm going to be using six strands of embroidery floss. You can use fewer if you'd like though. And I've drawn a circle with a friction pin on this piece of material just to help guide me so I don't go wandering off into the edges. We're going to start with the running stitch, which is the most simple and basic of stitches, and it's super useful. It's used for hand sewing and quilting and in clothes, make, clothes making, and it is the foundation stitch for Sashiko. It can also be very decorative. You can keep your stitches all even, or you can vary the size of each stitch. It's totally up to you. So all you do is come up in one place, leave a little space, and come back up. So up at A, leave a little, uh, make a stitch here, and down at B. Up at A, and down at B. You can vary the size of the stitches, and you can vary the size of the spaces between the stitches. Next up is the back stitch. This is just the running stitch smushed together. The first stitch actually goes forward, although this is not a hard and fast rule, and then advances by taking back stitches. So you would come up at A, go down however far big you want to make your stitches. And again, that the length and size of your stitches is up to you. And then after that, you come up at C, so A, B, C. And then you go back and go into that hole that you made just before in B. So A, B, C, and then back into B. And now you start going further forward. Come up and go down in C. This is a great stitch to use for outlining, and if you're making letters, this is a great stitch because it makes a nice continuous line. And like with the running stitch, the size of the stitches is completely up to you. Let's talk about the stem stitch next. This is a variation of the back stitch. I used it on the tree trunk here. It gives a little bit of texture. It makes it look, look, look a little bit like bark on a tree. It also makes a good filling stitch, which I did on this book here. And it can be used for outlining also. As with many of these stitches, there's more than one way to do them. And it doesn't really matter, it's just so long as the result is what you want. Uh, for, I've seen several different ways to do the stem stitch. I've heard it also called outline stitch, depending on which direction you uh, place your stitches. Um, I'll show you how I'm doing the stem stitch. It's pretty simple. So I made a stitch, which is gonna be the length of the stitches 
and then I go about halfway the uh, length of this stitch to bring my needle up. Bring it up, and now I'm going to, and I am going to go below, halfway below this stitch. And then again, half the length of a regular, of the first stitch that I did. And then halfway along the back stitch, the previous stitch rather, that I did. And as you can see, it kind of um, creates a thicker line than a back stitch. And there you go. Now I have seen it where they put the stitches to the top, like up here, instead of below, like I'm doing. Uh, I don't think it matters really that they look pretty much the same. I would recommend though that you keep uh, the, which side you put your needle back in uh, to be the same throughout the line that you're making. You can see it makes kind of a nice um, almost a wavy line there. And like I said, it can add a lot of texture. And it is a little bit thicker than a back stitch, so it does uh, work as a filling stitch as well. Okay, now we're going to work on the chain stitch. Uh, this is a great little stitch. Uh, it makes little loops. That when strung together look like a chain or look like knit stitches on a sweater. Uh, very useful for filling in, for making a nicer, thicker outline. Uh, just a real pretty stitch. Uh, there's also a variation of it where you just stitch the individual lengths of the chain, and that's often called a lazy daisy stitch. And we're, I'll talk about that in a little bit, a little further along in here in our instructions. So. Very uh, straightforward again, just like all of these stitches. So you bring up your thread uh, at the beginning of wherever you want to start your line. And I use my non-dominant hand, my left hand here, and hold the thread to the left, a little bit kind of out of the way, kind of looped here. And then I'm gonna put the needle back down where I just brought it up, brought the thread up from, and I'm going to I call it rocking, uh, bringing the needle back up about the length of however long you want your uh, loops on your chain to be. And then I'm gonna pull that thread through, making sure that the thread is below where I'm pulling. I got a little, got a little bump there and you can see there's the chain. Now you can pull them real tight and they'll um, make a, a long kind of narrow chain like that, or you can leave it a little looser if you want a wider chain. Also uh, the kind of thread you use makes a big difference. So again, just to make the next chain, I'm going to go put the needle back in where it came up and rock it forward the length of however um, long I want the chain to be now. And I'm trying to match up the chains so that they're about the same size, but again, it's an artistic choice on your part. You can make them however you want. And you just continue in that way. So I'm getting close to finishing up and I'll show you how you finish off uh, the end of the chain. Now I'm doing a circle here, so I'm gonna hook up connect up with the first stitch I made, but the, uh, the way you finish off would be the same. And we'll go over this again when we do the Lazy Daisy stitch. So you just finish up, and I've uh, finished up that last stitch right at the end of the bottom, I guess you would say, of the very first chain I made. And I pulled it however um, tightly I want. And then I'm just bringing the needle right back down where that very first, um, where I very first brought up the thread. Uh, just pull it straight. That tacks down that last chain. 
and it becomes a continuous line. Okay, let's try doing a fly stitch now. So this is a little bit like a chain stitch because you catch the thread before you pull it tight and that helps create the pattern. So I'm gonna bring it up, uh, bring up my needle and thread where I wanna start my line and then I go down back down about the length that I want uh, the rest, all of my stitches to be around. So this is kind of like the foundation stitch. Now I'm going to bring up my needle on this side of the thread, at that first stitch rather. So up like that. Now I'm going to catch the thread under my thumb like this, and I'm going to go down on the opposite side of that stitch. So not down below, like you might expect, but over here. So you go back down, and I'm still holding the thread with my thumb. And I'm going to bring the needle back up before I pull the thread all the way tight at the bottom of the first foundation stitch that I made. And I'm pull it up, catching that thread. And there, it's the first fly stitch. Now to continue, just going to make another stitch down in the direction I want it. Again, about the same length as the first one, as close as possible. Again, that's an artistic choice, doing it however you want. Again, almost straight opposite from that one. Catching the thread with my thumb. Bringing the needle back up there and pulling it through, catching that thread. This is great for, this is just a real interesting line stitch. You can make it with much smaller stitches. It also could be used as foliage and you could add flowers or um, little buds or more leaves at the ends of the, of the arms here of the stitch. Catch that thread with my thumb. Make sure the thread's under the, the working thread. There you go. So I'm just about finished with my circle here using a fly stitch. And uh, of course, if you're doing a straight line, you don't need to connect them, but I'm going to do that now. So I'm gonna go back in through where I originally, back when I started, started making my circle with a fly stitch here. And it's really, it's just the same. And as you become comfortable with it, you don't have to go entirely up and down. You can do this rocking motion when it saves you a little time. Goes a little bit quicker. Make sure the thread's under the needle. There you go. And I'm just gonna make a little tiny tack stitch, just going back into that same hole again. And pull it through. There you have a complete circle. Satin stitch is next. This is a pretty basic stitch that anyone can master very quickly. I've drawn a little heart here to help guide me because I'm terrible at just free stitching. I just like to have a little bit of a guide. And it's simply bringing the needle up and down, keeping the stitches close together to make a smooth, even surface. It's real popular as a filling stitch, like I'm doing here, filling in this little heart shape. It's very versatile. It can fill in any shape, from quite small to larger. I got a little bit of a catch there. Pull it through now. I like to make sure that the all lay the stitches all lay nice and neat together. This 
thread has a little bit of a sheen to it, so it makes it look kind of satiny. And it's all nice and even like this. It's better to use, if you're working on a pattern that you're using usually only a couple threads for, if it's a larger uh, object, you're probably gonna wanna use more threads. So I'm using six threads here. I've used six threads throughout this little demo. So not a big difference, noticeable difference. And like I said, it can be quite versatile. So in this piece, for instance, when I stitched her arm, I gradually changed direction to indicate her elbow and then her forearm there. So, and you can see, I kind of uh, shortened up some of the stitches and it made others like here at the point of her elbow a little bit longer and just kind of made that curve. And you can see too, like here in the Monstera leaves, I used longer, longer stitches, kind of indicate the leaves being kind of long there. And up here, this is kind of a variation of satin stitch. It really basically is satin stitch. It's called, often called short and long stitch, or sometimes brick stitch. This is kind of an uneven one, but it's layers of uh, satin stitch in different colors to create the stripes on the snake plant. Okay, let's work on the Lazy Daisy stitch like I promised before. This is very similar to the chain stitch. It's just your um, individual links in the chain, as it were. So like on the chain stitch, you bring it up at one point wherever you want your the point of your pedal or chain to be. And you go back down at in or very, very close to that where you came up originally. And then bring your needle back up the distance that you want your stitch, or in this case, your loop to be and pull your needle through, making sure that your working thread stays through that loop. So there, you have a single loop. Now to secure it to the fabric, simply make a tiny tack like that, so that it will now stay where it's supposed to. So I'm just gonna randomly put some here different directions. So again, I'm keeping the, yard, uh, the thread out of the way, bringing my needle back down where I first brought it up, and up again, however long I want that loop to be. Pull your thread through, making sure that your needle and yarn stay, go through the loop, and then you catch your a tiny tack stitch to catch the loop and secure it to the fabric. So you can do these randomly any which way you want, like I'm doing here. You can make them go all in one direction, um, like similar to what I did with the tree that I showed you earlier, that uh, design when I made the individual leaves for the tree. You can also arrange them. They work really nice and to make the little flower. And let me show you. Bring this up one more place. If you took the visible mending class last year, um, you will see that these are just lazy daisy stitches. And they're arranged so that the point where it came up is in the center and it makes a real nice um, little flower and you can make it different sizes depending on how big uh, the loop is. Um, these two, I also added a straight stitch right down the middle to kind of fill in that um, flower. You could even use a different color than what the rest of the uh, thread is, or you could leave them open like I did here. Okay, just one last little loop here. As you can see, I just randomly place them so it kind of is, can be used even as a fill stitch. You could put them real close together to fill a large space. And I wanted to point out that uh, the rest of the stitches I used um, six strands of floss, but on this one I'm using just three. 
and that makes it easier, especially with a smaller stitch like this, to create a loop that you can tell it's actually a loop. So, so you can tell this red on the chain stitch, I used six strands of floss, and then using three here makes them a little more uh, visible. Okay, it's time to master the French knot. Um, a lot of people fear the French knot, but it's actually pretty straightforward. And once you master a couple tips, it's you'll not have to think twice about it again. It has lots of uses because it adds texture and contrast, and it can be a detail all on its own. Uh, for example, here in this design for the bird, I used a French knot for the eye on the bird. And then for the flowers, I filled the center in with little French knots. You can see there. And on the tree, I used French knots to create both the blossoms on this side and the snowflakes on this side. Now I'm using six strands of floss and I'm going to wrap my thread around my needle twice. Uh, this is entirely up to you, what you do with your French knots, and I invite you to experiment with them. Uh, fewer threads and and or fewer wraps will create a smaller French knot. Uh, more threads and more wraps will create a larger French knot. Uh, it depends on what you want to use it for. If you're just doing random stitches like I'm doing here, I'm kind of doing a medium-sized French knot. Uh, if you want to do something small, you want to reduce uh, the number of threads, the number of dots, or maybe you want to reduce the number of threads but wrap your needle three or four times. Uh, it's entirely up to you. And it's uh, fun to see how the different ones look. So let's get started. I've uh, pulled my thread up where I want my uh, knot to be. And then I'm going to take my needle and wrap the thread around the needle twice. If I can get my uh, thread, working thread out of the way. So wrap it around twice and pull it uh, don't pull it too tightly. I find then you have trouble pulling the needle through, but you want to pull it uh, gently, uh, firmly but gently, I would say, and bring it down close to the surface of your fabric, and then pull your needle through the, to the back. And if you've done it too tightly, you might have a little trouble pulling uh, the needle through. Uh, there are different kinds of needles, and uh, a needle with a small, slim eye works better, especially if you're doing small French knots. It's easier to pull that needle. Uh, this one has, this needle has a, uh, it's a fairly large needle. It doesn't have too bad of a bulge, but sometimes the eye of the needle um, bulges out, causes the needle shaft to bulge out just a little bit to accommodate the eye. Sometimes those can be a little more difficult to uh, pull through. So I wrapped it twice and I pull with my left hand, pull the working thread gently, not super tight. And then I pull the needle through. Um, I like to hold the knot, the thread that's gonna create the knot. I like to kind of hold it firmly there. Um, that helps create a neat and tidy knot there, as you can see. Let's go again. So pull your needle up where you want it to appear. If you are having trouble getting the needle to pull through, try easing up on how tightly you're pulling the wrap. Like, especially like I will kind of pull it tightly here and then loosen it, just let it relax then right before I pull the needle through. And again, I find holding the the wound threads against the fabric kind of helps. So I'm gonna do a couple more here. I'm just randomly placing them around here. You can experiment with different colors. I've seen them used as fill for relatively large areas. It's a lot of French knots. If you have an embroidery hoop stand, which is a stand that holds your hoop for you, um, so you have both hands free. They're ideal to use when you're doing French knots. And don't panic when this happens. 
just kind of gently, you know, my, my um, thread has gotten kind of twisted, which happens a lot with French knots. So just gently pull back on it and then pull it through. So let's do another one right over here. So again, two wraps back right next to, you could go back in exactly the same spot, but I prefer to go just right next to where you brought the needle up originally. And then just hold it gently and pull it through. I'd like to recommend a couple books from the library that might help you with your stitching. This first one is called Freshly Stitched. Modern Embroidery for the Absolute Beginner by Celeste Johnson. This is a great book. It starts out with some information on getting started with embroidery, including floss and fabric and transferring your design and so forth. And there's a series of designs inside the book that are beginner friendly, but are really interesting and fun to stitch. Even a non-beginner would have a lot of fun with these. And then it finishes up at the back here with some illustrations of stitching, of different stitches. This is great if you would like a visual reference of some of the stitches that we've uh, looked at today. And also if you'd like to expand your uh, repertoire and try some new stitches. Next, I have this one called Beautiful Embroidered Accessories. This is by Lexi Brantman. This has a lot of great information too. Again, some embroidery basics here, a stitch guide, again, illustrating different stitches, many of which we talked about, but also some new ones. Once you get the basics, it's easy to expand your repertoire to something new. And then they have a lot of patterns uh, for accessories like caps. Lots of fun in this book. Both of these are available at the Davenport Public Library, and I'll have information about the authors and the titles in the notes below. I hope you enjoyed this episode, and will join us again next time. Until then, happy stitching!